Welcome to Gardening and Beyond. I'm Lee Reeder. Whether your yard has newly planted saplings, century-old oaks, or trees of mixed ages and types, you have probably wondered how best to care for them. Today's guest has answers. Alby Tumson is an ISA certified arborist, ISA tree risk assessment qualified, and is an ASCA registered consulting arborist. He has worked for Sperry Tree Care since 1999 and with plants and trees since 1984. Born in Verviers, Belgium, he moved to Eugene in 1992. Alby loves crafting, wood carving, charcoal drawing, hiking, fly fishing, bird watching, and studying trees. So welcome to the show, Albie. It's great Thank to you. have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so the mm, first thing mm. we need to get clarified is these acronyms. <laughs> Please tell us what ISA and ASCA mean. Okay. The ISA is the acronym for the International Society of Arboriculture. Uh, it's an organization that is national, international actually, and um, it's something that you are encouraged to join whenever you become an arborist. So you sharpen your skills. There's uh, something that you don't have to take, but uh, it's kind of a voluntary thing to do to be pretty much um, seen as a professional. You have to take an exam, you have to study, take an exam, and you have to maintain that certification uh, throughout the years. So every three years you have to be recertified either by taking exam again or having enough credits to be recertified. Um, That's a U.S.-based organization? Yes. It's, yeah, it's based in Illinois, but it's international. So mm -hmm. you have ISA certified arborist in Australia, I see. in Europe, uh, in Japan, uh, you know, just, just about everywhere. Mm -hmm. ASCA, ASCA, is the American Society of Consulting Arborists, which is separate from ISA. And it's also another voluntary program that you are encouraged to take. If you are going to be writing reports, you, have, you are trained to be pretty much professional, being able to have a good format when you write your reports. Um, that is also pretty uh, demanding <laughs> and uh, something that I accomplished in 2007. But you don't have to be an ASCA RCA to write reports, but something that I decided to do. So having these certifications mm. would be something like the equivalent of having peer-reviewed articles published? Yes. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a way of having your, mm -hmm. your cohort, your mm -hmm. professional uh, colleagues mm -hmm. endorse or approve of what you are doing. Yes, exactly. Yes. So much, that, yeah. that gives it quite a bit of value. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and well. again, it's, it's, uh, you have people who are not certified in any way and are awesome arborists. Mm -hmm. I know a few that are. Just excellent. That's something that we decide to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. always good to have your work acknowledged by others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I agree. <laughs> yeah. So w what would you say is the number one question that you receive about tree care? Well, usually that happens when we, at Spare Tree Care, we do the home show. And uh, it's funny how it works, but people usually come and ask questions when they see something wrong with their trees. If everything is fine, they don't usually <laughs> ask a lot of questions, but it usually comes with um, something is wrong. There's a part of the tree that is dying. Um, the leaves are not uh, the right color, or they're losing leaf early. So it really is, uh, they have a concern. It's mm -hmm. usually coming with what's wrong with it. Uh, well, you know, I need to see it, usually. They, sometimes a few... A few details of what they see can be pretty, uh, pretty easy for me just to p picture what, what's wrong with the tree. So, and mm -hmm. when they bring you these these questions, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. there um, is there a typical problem for the Willamette Valley that afflicts trees? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. We we do have uh, a few pests and diseases that are very, very, very common that keep seem to keep coming back whenever the, you know, I, I expect at this time of year, for example, I expect people to talk to me about a part of the tree that is not leafing out. Well, that, for example, would be uh, a disease that could be related to the disease called verticillium wilt, mm -hmm. which is very, very common in maples, redbuds, 
uh, other plants. Uh, Red buds. Oh yeah. my! Yeah. I just planted nine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll have yeah. to be on the watch nine for that. Buds, yeah. <laughs> well, so it, it, and people say, okay, well, what's going on? Last year my tree was fine. It was leafing everywhere. This year one branch is not leafing out. Usually that tells me that you might have a resilient wood. It's very, very common. It's a root disease. It's a fungus mm -hmm. that plugs the conducting vessels of the root. And the foliage, the part of the canopy that is connected to that root, is usually drying out. Mm -hmm. um, it could be severe when a small tree is planted in a place where you have a lot of resilient wood and it dies in one season. It could be brought up with soil because it's a soil-borne disease and you could have a very old maple, uh, beautiful maple starting to die one branch at a time. And so it's... it's so it's if, very, if yeah. your tree has verticillium wilt, what do you do? Can you do anything? Um, you can't really do anything once it's in the ground. You would have to get rid of everything, the soil, mm -hmm. nuke everything. Oh. Uh, I would say if you are afraid that you have verticillium wilt and you want to plant a tree there, you should do a, a, a soil, soil sample. Test. Mm -hmm. salt, salt sample and then or if you do have a resilient will you know select the list of trees that are not susceptible and plant uh, something else you know, so there are else. trees that are resistant yeah, to yeah. verticillium wilt yeah. oh that's yeah. good to know yeah one of my favorite uh, would be for example the parodia which is the persian ironwood which is you know really really pretty but persian but ironwood yeah. Hmm, yeah. i have not heard of this one phenomenal fall color gorgeous bulletproof and does it yeah. work well on the valley floor? Does yes. it need, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. quite a few actually. If you go to Trader Joe's, the parking lot uh, south of Trader Joe's uh, has quite a few. They're okay, really, I will really watch for those next yeah. time yeah. I'm there. But that's, you know, pests, um, aphids, people always complain about aphids. And mm -hmm. um, last year was a bad aphid year. And people on the trees? They yes. Aphids yeah. on trees, I had that. Uh, yeah. hmm. Tulip trees are pretty susceptible to aphids. Lindens, um, the aphid sucks the chloroplast out of the leaf. And actually, uh, the dejection of the aphid is called honeydew, and it's very sticky. So uh, usually people say, well, I can't park my car underneath the tree because it's getting very sticky on the car. I have to keep washing my car. True. Yeah, that's so, so. That's that's basically yeah. aphid poop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's aphid poop. Yeah, honeydew is aphid poop. And and you know, uh, people want to have a uh, quick response, quick solution. Spray this, spray that, and we know how it, that could be detrimental to a lot of beneficial insects to, mm -hmm. to spray. So uh, I always tell people, you know, natural predators are doing really good. They we don't see them, but they're doing. A heck of a job, and uh, it doesn't cost any money. And no. I've not. No. Is it possible that aphids could kill a tree? Is that no? That I've never happen? seen a tree killed by aphids ever. Okay, so this is yeah. merely uh, a convenience. matter of convenience rather than of yeah. necessity in yeah. saving the tree. I always tell people yeah. move the car. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> you can move the tree. Well, you throw can a move tarp the car over too. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one one of ways to to do that. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it could ruin, it could ruin the car if you stay. Well, keep then the they car can throw there. a tarp over it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah there's yeah, no other place to yeah, park the car. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> One has to be a lot more considerate of trees, I think. Yeah. 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 What about the shade it gives you? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. The, the, the shade, the habitat it provides for wildlife. Yes. Yeah. Oxygen. Yeah. What's wrong with fresh air, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beauty all yeah. year long. You know. And value. Value to a property. A lot of people forget that. But, uh, That's true. The real estate uh, start to wake, wake up to this, but a mature tree in a property brings 12 to 15 percent more value to the property. Mm -hmm. It's been established and well proven that it's, a, it's the case. People will buy a house in a neighborhood with a lot of trees a lot easier than mm -hmm. if it was. I know I would trees. if yeah. I were out looking for a house. 
Me too. <laughs> so are there any other really common questions that you hear routinely uh, from Yes, people? yes, conflict with neighbors also. Really? Yeah. So you're yeah. an arbiter as yeah. well as an yes, arborist. I'm a shrink. <laughs> yeah. That tree is growing in my property, what can I do? It's shading my garden, so I, I, um, it's a lot easier to, uh, to see the place and talk to both parties. So I have been, yeah, the rubber seal between the two and, and try to mitigate and things. And, and, uh, are you fairly successful at that, or does it just depend Usually, on yeah, yeah, usually. And I've, <laughs> I've come down situations where people are screaming at each other, but it's, it's part of what I do. Um, you do have a right to prune whatever is overhanging your property. That's the common law. So long as you don't jeopardize the life of the tree by removing too much mm -hmm. or creating a hazard. Because Those then are you're the affecting light. the property value of the other people. Yes, and you could actually just create a, a hazard. The tree could uh, actually just either die or being unbalanced. And um, I've seen a situation where fur was at the edge of a property that was very uh, woodsy. And the only foliage w of that tree was pretty much over the property line. And the place uh, was owned by an old lady who left for vacation. And the neighbor rented a lift and removed everything of that fur on her site. And he said, I have the right. Yes, but in this case, he reduced, he removed everything. That the tree lost about 95% of its foliage. Being a fir, the, cat, the tree cannot recreate foliage to stay alive, so it was, the tree was going to die. Oh. So she could have had a way of just uh, suing that person for what uh, they did, and, but she said, I'm too old to go through that, and I, she didn't want to go through to court, but she had the right in that case. So it's always, you know, it's a lot simpler. I, all I have to do is tell people we could, we don't have to remove the branches, we could prune back, mm -hmm. you can move the garden, you know, I always try to find solutions because mm -hmm. I, it's, you know, you don't want to live in war with your neighbors. No, no, that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, not fun. No, that's not fun. That's not fun. And sometimes, you know, asking first. Most of the time people don't ask. They just come and do it when the people are gone. Mm -hmm. and they come back and it's too late. Just ask. Yeah, I've hey, experienced that. And, and yeah. sometimes they're just genuinely trying to be helpful, but they mm -hmm. still don't ask. Yeah, <laughs> and, I'd rather do it myself. Yeah, yeah. Or, or be at least have the opportunity to talk it over yeah. and, and see yeah. if there's something that works better for yeah, everyone. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds like the reasonable approach. Of course, we know that the world is not entirely populated no. with reasonable people. No. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, you know, a lot of people sometimes just are very angry about their trees. It's usually a matter of mess. I, I was taking my truck this morning, and I've got ashes in front of my house. And right now they're budding out and dropping the big buds. Yes. For opening. And my truck was full of debris. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, I, it's the time of year when I'm going to have people saying, oh, my tree's so messy. And it, when you really put it in perspective, it's like maybe two weeks out of the year that the tree creates a mess. And people are focusing on that moment. I, I've had it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, are you sure you, you want to remove the tree? Because I don't think that's a good idea. It's an indicator yeah. of our stressful lives. When, yeah. when two weeks yeah. of inconvenience becomes yeah. uh, a deal breaker mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and obliterates the whole rest of the year. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when it's time to start taking up meditation and <laughs> yeah. calming down. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they have a calming effect. You know, mm -hmm. trees are just... Yeah, that's the wonderful thing about trees and all plants, mm -hmm. for me at least. I, yeah. They are just so calming mm -hmm. and soothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's being difficult. around nature. It's difficult to imagine a world without them. I don't think we can afford that. No. <laughs> So do you encourage people to do their own pruning or to get an arborist to do their pruning? I always love uh, sharing knowledge and uh, most of the pruning that, uh, a lot of pruning can be done by a homeowner. It's really, really, really uh, not complicated. And especially when you deal with roses, because arborists are working with 
heathers, from heather material to redwoods, you mm -hmm. know, everything in between. Mm -hmm. So homeowners probably going to be able just to work for the he from the heathers to maybe a lilac or Japanese maple in size. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that is um, easy to learn when you just prune. It's very easy to make big mistakes. And um, so I, I like to share that information. Sometimes people hire me for an hour and they say, I really want to, l to learn how to prune my blueberries. And I know it's not complicated, I just want, it, I want to do it myself. And then I teach them how to prune, the, prune their blueberries. I would say it's a lot. So most, most people can do that, but we do have a part of the population that does not want to do any physical work, cannot do any physical work and uh, don't have the time to do physical work, mm -hmm. uh, whatever that is. And if it's pruning, I would say it's probably good to hire an arborist so they can have their trees properly taken care of. Bad pruning could lead to a lot of trouble a lot of, uh, down the line. And so, uh, especially when you start having to climb on a ladder and getting a little above your, <laughs> your level of uh, comfort, it's probably better to call an arborist. You know, YouTube is full of videos of people trying to do things. <laughs> and probably uh, <laughs> failing badly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're paying at the hospital what they could have paid. To have that done properly. <laughs> so, yeah, it happened. So, yes, I would say there's a moment when you, you should do it. Uh, you, sh you should have someone else doing it and a, hopefully a professional. And I've got exceptions, you know. 85-year-old mm -hmm. men who just don't want to see me in their yard, and the, the wife is saying, I told you, it, you need to have someone else doing it. I can do it by myself. <laughs> that, that's I admire those guys. That's not an age thing. That's a man yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never had a woman saying, let me climb that tree, honey. <laughs> yeah, it's always men, for some reason. And chainsaws. Yeah. <laughs> and chainsaws. <laughs> Another topic. <laughs> I'll come back for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do not do this at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, so for so, good tools are very, very useful. And and again, chainsaws. I have a tendency of just putting chainsaws for cutting down tree or just cutting large sections of a of a tree that fell. Most of the pruning we do every day. Uh, I would say 85% of the pruning we do is done with uh, hand pruners, mm -hmm. hand saws, mm -hmm. pole saws, pole pruner. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, it's pretty quiet time until you fire up the chipper and just, you know, get rid of the debris. I mean, uh, fruit trees, you know, it's a lot of it is just hand pruning. Yeah. A lot of it ha should be hand pruning. Again, put the chainsaw down. <laughs> You know. you know, this whole discussion is reminding me of uh, an experience that I had just this past winter. Mm -hmm. I had gone out to prune a little apple tree on my property. Mm -hmm. And the, I don't know who, if someone planted the tree there or if it was a volunteer. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's somewhat under a much larger big leaf maple. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's kind of reaching out to one side to mm -hmm. get to the light mm -hmm. and, and is just partially s shaded mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. canopy of the maple. Mm -hmm. So I was attempting on top of a ladder with a pole saw to prune <laughs> a, a very large branch on that maple that was uh, yeah, you know, yeah. partially shading yeah. the apple. Yeah. I got absolutely nowhere. I didn't oh. get hurt. Okay. I just wore myself out and then yeah. finally conceded defeat because yeah. I, I just, I couldn't get up high enough. I didn't yeah. have the leverage. You know, I finally just yeah. said, this is stupid. Why am I doing and this? You know, that's always, oh my gosh, yeah. that's a YouTube thing coming back. <laughs> that brand just, just takes the ladder right underneath you. Yeah, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think I was positioned so that yeah. that would have happened. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not completely clueless about mm -hmm. pruning, um, but it, it just was beyond my capabilities mm -hmm. to do yeah. it. So I, I finally just decided one of these days I'm going to have to have somebody mm -hmm. with the proper equipment <laughs> come out here to do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's... Uh, um, oh, uh, that's another wise. point I wanted to make was that OSU Extension Service, mm -hmm. of course, offers pruning classes yes. uh, multiple times during the year, but especially mm -hmm. in the winter months. So mm -hmm. um, I, I 
think that there is usually some nominal fee, but mm -hmm. um, you know those are open mm -hmm. to anybody. It doesn't cost that much, mm -hmm. and you can get a lot of really good expert yeah. advice on on how to print yeah. a whole variety of plants from yeah. from vines to uh, to trees. And the misconception about pruning sometimes is people assume that we have to do that during the dormant season, and it's if that was the case, you know we would be pretty much uh, useless in the summer. We prune all year long, you do have a different reaction from the tree, whether you prune in winter mm -hmm. or you prune in summer. If you, let's say you prune an apple tree in the winter, you promote growth, yes. you stimulate growth. And if you prune the same tree the following summer, you are going to uh, reduce the amount of growth. You will, the tree's already leafed out, mm -hmm. And every time you take a cut, the tree focuses on closing the wound rather than replacing the branch. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stimulate, winter is great. If you want to reduce the amount of growth, summer is better, to put that in a nutshell. Yeah. And right now, if kind of a crucial moment to prune as well, because it's pretty much, you know, the, it's, it's full spring mm -hmm. and fall also. It's kind of a crucial moment, but if the tree is healthy to begin with, that should be fine. What about uh, other trees, like maple trees, mm -hmm. uh, oak, whatever, you know? When, yeah. when, is there a particularly good time to prune them, or does it matter? Again, if uh, most of what I hear from people who have maples, for example, uh, Japanese maple, to, to, say, to say a good example, they want the tree to, to be thin and aesthetically pruned, so it actually is very uh, beautiful to look at. If you prune too thin, if you do that in the winter, uh, you're going to have to come back in summer and work to remove all those little suckers that came back, <laughs> the, the water sprout. So I, will, I would always say to people, it's probably better to wait until summer, and then you have a longer mileage for the pruning that you, you do. It's going to last a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, early June is fine, and then you don't have to fight those suckers quite often. You know, it's probably take a couple of years before you have something going on. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, m moving on uh, beyond pruning, what are common mistakes that you see people making mm. in general <coughs> in tree care? Um, well, back to pruning a little bit, it's um, pruning too much is a common mistake. People get carried away. They get a new tool and they get they get carried away. So it's usually uh, easy to prune too much. How can you tell that a tree has been pruned too much? Uh, well, you have to look at it first to know how much foliage you have. And um, the idea of thinning, for example, people will get to one tree and start pruning the, let's say you have multiple nice trunks, they will remove everything that is green or branching out until they can't reach. They put <laughs> they, they're going to prune for the next one, and then they can't reach. So you end up, end up having a tree that a tree looks... That goes like yeah, that. <laughs> you have a tree that looks like it's been lion-tailed, which is actually a common, you know, it's a, it's a term that we use. Oh, that would be and embarrassing. So you, what I like to have is intermediate foliage through the canopy. Sure. It's okay to thin, but don't thin. It needs don't to Don't flush it up and, and, okay, I'll do that later. <laughs> so that's one way to, to make mistakes. Topping a tree is very bad, too. And if you... If you have to reduce the size of the tree constantly, maybe you don't need that tree. Right, right. Uh, or maybe it's in the wrong location. Mm -hmm. Common reason why someone would shorten a tree is because it's right underneath the eave of the roof. You know, it's getting into the gutters and mm -hmm. people say, oh, I'm gonna. if you do that, you're going to fight a battle endlessly because the tree will just keep sprouting and sprouting. Mm -hmm. Try to do that with a plumber, you know, you, you'll have fun for years. And um, so that would, be, um, that would be a mistake. Pruning in the wrong location where the branch is attached to the trunk is also a common mistake. Tendency to prune too close to the trunk. That actually came with a chainsaw. Before when you had only hand saws, you were, you were pruning the least amount of wood, which is actually where the branch starts getting yes. into. So people were to better pruners right when next before to the, the chainsaws. Color. Yeah. Yeah. And when the chainsaw came along, it was the, the perfect place to put the bar. It's 
on the branch collar and just let it go. Mm -hmm. So for and still some people who assume that it's the closer you get to the trunk, the better. And sometimes they even cut to make it almost like oh. aerodynamic or, oh my. you know, they try oh. to recreate the, the trunk. Oh, that, that and makes then they put tar, painful to you think know, about. <laughs> they put paint and paint is, you don't need to do this. Mm -hmm. Trees have understood a long, long time before humans were even a thought mm -hmm. that they had ways to deal with to decay, which is wound. compartmentalized. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they seal, they don't heal, they seal. Um, other mistakes, um, especially when you plant a tree, <coughs> start at the beginning of the life of the tree, you could actually just uh, uh, make lots of mistakes uh, when you plant a tree. Um, you could also plant a tree that is not really a good candidate to plant. You could have a tree that's been potted too deep. I did that. I planted a tree Thursday. Uh, it was a lilac. And I really had to remove a lot of the soil until I found the flare. The flare is the, f the base of the trunk yes. that starts to get into the roots. And the tree had been backfilled about five inches too deep. And I really dug until I found that flare. Mm -hmm. And at the flare were a lot of suckers yes. that had been cut. So I believe intentionally, because it's a, it's a lilac, it had been putted too deep so that it would so smother it would the suckers. Oh. oh, to smother them. S smother them. So you've got to be careful with this. Um, don't plant too deep. Again, if you have the right, you fi find the, the flare, you want to mm -hmm. make sure the flare is mm -hmm. about an inch above the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, connecting the right tree for the right soil crucial. If you have a place where the soil does not drain at all, you have heavy clay, don't try to plant a dogwood. Dogwood don't like that. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that you adore dogwoods, it might not be the best place for that. Just go and enjoy them somewhere else. It's, it's really, really uh, uh, a big issue. We master gardeners have a, a motto, the mm -hmm. right plant for the right location. Yeah, that's, that's it can be Saves everybody mm -hmm. so much time, grief, oh, and yeah. money. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, also watering, the proper watering is also very important. As you plant, and for me, the best time of the year to plant is in the fall. That's uh, when I do most of my yeah, planting. Yeah, it, it's the best. But because we're humans and we wake up in the spring and look at everything that is blossoming, and uh, we want to plant a tree in the, f in the spring, well... It's okay, but it's better in the fall. Um, as I plant a tree, I always water as I plant. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I get rid of all the air pockets, that the root ball that I have is moist, and the soil around it is moist. All the backfill is going to be moist. Um, my general rule of thumb that is came from a book that I read anyway, is you probably need to water your new tree for the first two summers for sure at the rate of 15 gallons per week per inch of diameter. So if you have a tree that is two inches in diameter when you plant it, which is measured six inches from the ground, you need 30 gallons per week for that tree to be really successful. That's a lot of water. Yeah. And it needs to be watered in the, uh, infrequently and deep. So the common question is people say, oh, so, so many numbers, you know, what how do you measure 30 gallons? And I said, you take a five-gallon bucket, you turn the hose, just maybe the, the thickness of this pen, not more, and you time it up. How long does it take to fill that five-gallon bucket? Mm -hmm. Multiply by six if, if, if you need 30 gallons and you have it. If it takes an hour and a half, it takes an hour and a half to water that tree. Once a, uh, once a week. And um, again, I, you know, <laughs> I've got people calling me back and say, my tree is not very, doing very good. The tree you planted is not very, doing very good. And the tree you planted. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. sometimes I plant. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's why I send a, what I call the cheat sheet with all the instruction mm -hmm. so people water properly. And sometimes I say, well, did you water properly? Ah, oh, I lost the cheat sheet. I, you said, like, uh, water often. I said, no, not often. And I eventually find out people, 
you know, are on the phone, they come back from work and they do this around the tree. And it's <laughs> for five minutes. For five minutes. <laughs> oh, I water every day, Albie. I water every day. And it's, that's a tease. You barely wet the top soil. Mm -hmm. and, especially um, if there's mulch. Yeah. Especially if they, there's they mulch. They watered the mulch. Yeah. They watered the mulch, yeah. yeah. The mulch is wet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I tell people, no, you really need to be diligent for the first two summers, you know. And that's the most crucial part for the survival of a new tree is proper watering. Make sure it doesn't go uh, dry, but make sure it doesn't drown either. Mm -hmm. If the soil, you know, if you put 30 gallons and two days later the water is still standing, you don't need 30 gallons, you know, I was going to say week. that this yeah. also is dependent yeah. on the type of soil yeah. that you have your yeah. tree planted in. And, you know, in this area, clay soils are very common. And yes. clay, of course, holds mm -hmm. moisture yeah. much better than other types oh, of yeah. soil. It's like a bowl. Yeah. So th yeah. then you would, you, you would just need to know your soil. Yes. And, and watch how long it takes for the water to, mm -hmm. to absorb. That's the first step, is know your soil. Mm -hmm. You write about that, right? Yeah, that's... Uh, that's very, very important. And also trees planted in, in the lawn. I hear, you know, so many times people say, oh, it's getting watered. You know, when I water the lawn, the tree's getting watered. It's not at all the same. Like, again, it's like a tease. Mm -hmm. It's just like a spray. And it's just like a molecule of a little bit of water on top of the, on top of the mulch. And if people sometimes water at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it just evaporates. So yeah. trees uh, mm -hmm. probably do not take in enough, um, enough water through their foliage to give them anywhere near their water needs. They, they yeah. really have to have water applied directly yes. to the roots. Oh, yeah. That's, that's where the water is needed. Mm -hmm. And you will need to, of course, wean the tree so it doesn't, you don't, don't have to water it 30 gallons <laughs> A week <coughs> in the hot season, of course, not in the winter, for the rest of the tree's life. You know, I always tell people, you know, for sure the first year, 30 gallons per inch of diameter, 15 gallons. And, you know, the following year, just try to reduce it to maybe 15 gallons every other week, see how the tree reacts. Mm -hmm. Because we're going into, you know, we're going to have more and more drought. Yeah. And so it's going to be crucial for people to understand proper watering and also choose a tree that is probably going to be more drought tolerant. You know, In your opinion, does drip, <coughs> wa drip irrigation suffice for this purpose? Yeah. 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 And, and if you, that's it, if you can dispense the amount of water that I was talking about any way you can see fit whether it's a hose that you hold, you pay a kid in the neighborhood to do that for you. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to do it. A soaker hose or even more elaborate, uh, a drip irrigation system with a... With a, a timer. A timer. If, so long as you have the right amount of water, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah I've got people that are very good at that. And, and it, that's fairly me. easy to set up on your own, isn't it? Yes. Drip irrigation yes. with a timer. Yeah. I, um, on batteries. I'm planning to do that myself, mm -hmm. but I haven't just sat down and focused mm -hmm. on it yet. Mm -hmm. But my property is still in development, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. so that's why it hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. Plus, I'm just a little bit mm. time-pressed. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of having a connection with what you plant. So the, 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 the fact of t dra dragging that hose and just you know, watering it properly and looking at the tree that you plant. But that's me. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's even better. Because we humans are lazy by, by nature and we, we have irrigation systems taking care of everything. And then, you know, it's, we lose that connection with the plant. I think it's, it's important to have it. Well, yeah. I was, for the, the drip irrigation though, I was thinking about making certain that the plant actually gets the water it needs mm -hmm. because the temptation mm -hmm. when you're watering with a hose is to not mm -hmm. water deeply enough yep. to not take mm -hmm. the time required yeah so that that's the trade-off mm -hmm. i suppose yeah if it's an hour and a half no, not a lot of people are going to be there <laughs> <laughs> yeah this past summer they don't do this I, anymore they look i at would their phone. routinely spend an hour and a half watering <laughs> yeah. the plants every yeah. day uh, during the dry season yeah. and it's it can be meditative i think it can yeah, yeah and Put if, if you're into that, yeah. 
and, and let's be honest, not mm -hmm. everybody is, but if mm -hmm. you're into it, yes, it's a very mm -hmm. soothing mm -hmm. exercise, yeah. Um, yeah. very centering. Mm -hmm. And the rewards are, you know, really magnificent. Whenever you see your tree just making it, it's just pushing growth. And oh, I know. Uh, there's great. nothing beats yeah. that yeah. Uh, for for people who are into mm. plants. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Again, it's just is making this accessible for yeah. everyone, regardless of their interest, to make yeah. sure that everyone can have successful mm -hmm. trees and plants. And That's right. So you have to figure out how to meet people where they are. Yeah. So um, why don't you, uh, did, unless you had more to say uh, on that subject, why don't you take a more step... More mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. hey, do, you have, do you have more mistakes to talk about? Um, yeah. Yeah, well, probably. Um, when you plant, make sure you have mulch around the base of the tree so you, your lawnmower doesn't run into the base of the tree. Uh, but, don't not, but not touching the tree, correct? Not touching the tree. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, that's, that's a very good point. Mulch is great. It's fantastic. It keeps the, the weeds down, holds moisture. It keeps the lawnmowers from hitting the tree. But a lot of problems happen when people pile up the mulch against the base of the tree. Yeah. Let's say you went through uh, all the trouble of put planting the tree at the right depth. It's perfectly placed. And then you pile up mulch. <laughs> What's going to happen is <coughs> out of the trunk, you're going to have little roots coming out, called adventitious roots. They're going to colonize that mulch. And eventually, the mulch, the the mulch is going to be colonized so much that the roots appear on the surface. So people see roots, they say, oh, we got to cover the roots. They add more, <laughs> more mulch. mulch. <laughs> the roots colonize, show up, they add more mulch. <laughs> I've got cases where the red maple was covered with, you know, I see a volcano is about two feet Oh, good deep, grief. Full of roots on the top. <laughs> and the only moment when you know, they, they finally sh stop, but it's a great picture. And it does not have to be that way. So add up mulch, keep the mulch, you know, because it disintegrates eventually. Keep the layer of mulch, whether it's two to three inches, so long as you keep the base of the tree free of mulch. How, how many <coughs> inches away from the tree base should the mulch be? It could be just within an inch. You could have, this, say, this is the base of my tree. I could have mulch here and tapering it off. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have two inches, so long as it, it does not apply. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's applied against the a, that space. Yeah. So at least one inch yeah. around the base of yeah. the tree before mm -hmm. the mulch begins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Common mistakes is not looking where you plant your tree. Uh, you you look at the location. You look at your yard. Say, okay, a tree here, a tree there. I always tell people, okay, where are the power lines? Do you have any power lines <laughs> above you? Because countless time I have people saying. So and so came, I mean, power company came and, and topped my tree. Oh, and they, they're very angry, but in, in truth, the tree was planted in the wrong location. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to plant a red oak, a big leaf maple, whatever, that is going to reach the power lines. And the power company cannot allow the tree to touch the line, so they just reduce the size of it. It's very, very crucial to do your homework to know what kind of tree you're going to plant, how big they're going to get, how wide they're going to be, and if you do have power lines in the way. I'm talking about the primary lines mm -hmm. that are uh, not insulated. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's much easier to um, work with uh, trees uh, and, and power lines that are not uh, um, primaries like uh, phone lines and everything, that's actually, you can actually plant a tree next to them because those lines can touch the tree eventually, that's not, but you know, if you don't have any lines in the way, that's perfect. You know. Well, you know what I have New seen, neighborhoods. what I've seen many times, uh, typically in cities, mm -hmm. is that the city insists on planting <coughs> trees under the power lines and then the utility company has to come oh, yeah. and take the tops out of the trees. Yeah. And then the tree dies at some point and they mm -hmm. replant a tree in the same place ah. to mm -hmm. grow up underneath of the power line. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is munis municipal authorities not talking yeah. to each other rather than yeah. homeowners not being mm -hmm. diligent. It's been better over the years. 
uh, especially if we're talking about the trees planted into the planting strip, which is mm -hmm. right of way belonging to the city of Eugene or Springfield, um, where uh, the tree selection that is available to be planted underneath power lines has become much better. Um, but yeah, it, it's... And by that, I take it, you <coughs> mean trees that don't that grow are not that tall. Reach, yeah. Right. yeah, a good example would be a Japanese snow bell, mm -hmm. um, uh, golden desert ash that tops at 20, 22 feet. Those usually are good trees to plant underneath power lines. It's, it's actually feasible. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's coming along really well. I mean, in that well, that's regard. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad yeah, to hear yeah, that. Yeah. But that's right. If you, if you have a, the recommendation is, yeah, you have to plant a tree because it's part of the, <coughs> the neighborhood that requires the tree to be planted a certain distance from, from the street. Sometimes it happens like that. And you have power lines above. That's, that's kind of ridiculous. You're restricted. For my whole <coughs> life, I have grieved every time. Even when I was mm -hmm. a child, I mm -hmm. grieved every time I saw the power company mm -hmm. taking the tops out of trees yeah. because they were up in the power lines. Mm -hmm. And then the tree is just so deformed yeah. and tragic looking yeah. afterward. And it just yeah. really causes me a lot of pain to see that. Yeah, it's not, it's not fun to see. It's not fun to see. And, and, you know, one way or the other, they have to keep the power from being interrupted. I've seen trees almost catching on fire because mm -hmm. they were right, they were touching. So, mm -hmm. that, you know, when it, when it, it creates havoc, yeah, yeah, it has to be done. But, yeah, a lot of planning goes a long way. <coughs> yeah. If you can actually just uh, create that. Well, didn't have breakfast, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you could hear that. <laughs> I, I thought it was a jet fly. Yeah, no, that's a jet fly. <laughs> <laughs> that's a jet fly. <laughs> it's not my stomach. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, um, it, 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 can, it can be avoided. And thank goodness now with new, new neighborhood uh, build up, they, they, everything is underground. You don't have to worry about those power lines anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, so you have a lot, a lot better choice. Yeah. Well, that's, that's very good to know, very mm. encouraging. Okay, are we, are we done with mistakes or? No, oh, I could go along. <laughs> long time with mistakes. Um, yeah, wrong tree, wrong place, um, bad pruning. Um, oh my gosh, it's just... Uh, planting it too deep. Planting it too deep, too much mulch. Um, trying to do things yourself and eventually just hurting yourself by uh, by doing it. I, I'm not trying to sell work, but it's it's really really crucial to be to be careful. You know, like uh, you know, I I uh, I'm not a fireman, so I'm not going to put out fire with a little hose. Mm. You know, it's, it's it's the kind of thing I don't do. So uh, yeah, it, it's. Uh, Try to also, yeah, probably I would say if you plan on planting trees around your house, try to see where the sun, take the time to take the a season to see where the sun is going. Where it, if you want shade, don't plant a tree, you know, in the wrong location because mm -hmm. it's, you planted it, you're going to have to replant it. Um, I've seen people covering themselves <coughs> with uh, uh, conifers because they want to be sheltered from the neighbors and they plant those conifers in the south side eventually they get too tall and you know in Oregon in western Oregon in winter if it's a winter where we have rain uh, not having light coming from the south in a house could that could be pretty gloomy so mm -hmm. think about planting your conifers maybe on the north side of your house instead of the south side and have deciduous trees on the south side so you could be sheltered from the sun in the summer, but if we have a beautiful day in January, at least you have that beautiful sunlight going through, especially right. if the sun is a lot lower, it goes right through the house. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I, uh, yeah, I, mistake that keeps on coming is the, the a tree that seems to, it's not the tree's fault, it's uh, <laughs> the landscapers or the, the arborist's fault to plant the, the wrong tree at the, right, the wrong place. Um, 
especially in the new neighborhoods where people are on top of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they want fast screen, they want to be sheltered from the neighbors quick. <coughs> and they are sold uh, Leyland cypresses. I don't know if you know what, tr what tree yes. that is. Leyland cypresses are amazing because they grow fast, extremely fast, and, and they, they don't really have much of a, of a pest issue. But they grow too fast and too big. And um, I think it's, uh, it's very important for whoever is selling those plants to say, well, okay, you want, sh you, you want screen, but how much room do we have? Uh, I've seen too many times uh, hedges of Leyland cypresses uh, planted about a foot from a fence or a, a wall. Oh, oh that's and a shame. <clears throat> and they grow fast. They give you a screen very fast. I, you know, no problem there. But they, they will reach height that are um, amazing. They can, Leyland cypresses can reach 75 feet tall. And so when the nursery is telling you, oh, no, they're just 20 feet. <laughs> how, much do you, how tall do you want them to be? Oh, that's exactly what they're going to be. 15. This is, this 15, is a dwarf 15. redwood. <laughs> yeah, it stops at 15, I guarantee it. <laughs> Buy them. And then eventually you end up having a nightmare because it, 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 it heaves up the fences. It, it, it eats your garden. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they grow they 45 degree angle branches and it just, they colonize everything. Wow. They grade wow. hedges, but they have but to But they be, have to have their space. They have to have their space. And you have to prune them. They're not going to stop at 15 feet. <laughs> you know, there are two that were removed on East Amazon about a, a month ago. And the diameter of each trunk was about the size of this table. Oh, good grief. Wow. We're talking, you know, four feet. How, how old were those trees, do you think? Oh, uh, 50, 50 years old, 40 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not, yeah. So, that's not so old for a trunk. Yeah, that and they diameter. grow fast. They grow extremely fast. I, uh, I've seen Leyland cypresses planted that were 10 years old, and their diameter was about a f foot in diameter. Wow. I mean, they're really, really yeah. fast growers. Yeah. Amazing trees, but they're fast growers. It's a hybrid, actually. Hmm. Yeah. So. Do those grow... Uh, do they, will they grow at a slightly higher elevation or do they do best on the valley floor? They do very good on the valley floor, mm -hmm. yeah. They will, they will do pretty much well ev everywhere. They're really stunted if they don't have much uh, of light. I've seen them planted in a row and then eventually the row goes underneath a, a, a nice big leaf maple. And you see the trees getting smaller and smaller, <laughs> and, <laughs> and almost nothing. They're almost the, the same way they were when they were planted. And the rest of the row is just flourishing and doing great. What are their water requirements? Pretty much the same, uh, especially for establishment. They will, I guess they will tolerate poor, poorly drained soils. And they will, I wouldn't call them wetland trees at all. But they will, um, they will do good in, in moist soils. And, but I've seen them in dry soils as well. They, their growth is not quite as aggressive. So I'm thinking about uh, our dry summers, if yeah. they would need irrigation at that time or you once they're established. You would need irrigation, yeah. So they, yeah. Okay. they would probably need irrigation. Even after they've been established. They will do better if any kind of uh, tree will do better with a little bit of water, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. ex except with a few exceptions. Uh, but they will, f definitely for establishment. After a while, they're, they're doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. I've seen some in, in locations where there's absolutely no water. They've been established and doing just great. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, mistakes. Um, if you have native trees, uh, and a proper example, uh, the big mistake I see a lot is the gorgeous Oregon white oak, which is one of the signature of our valley, those trees do not need water in the summer. They don't need water. They, you could have three weeks of 100 degree, and they're like, <clears throat> so. They're totally <laughs> fine without water. I couldn't stress that more. So uh, they're an, it's because they're a native. They're native, and if you look at the leaf of a big leaf maple, of a Oregon white oak, I'm sorry, it's actually pretty coarse, pretty leathery, so they hold water a lot mm. more. The problem with um, Oregon white oaks is uh, they're often 
including into a lawn. People will install a lawn because they want to maintain the tree. It's a beautiful part of the landscape. And a lawn has been established around the tree. Well, what do lawn need in the summer is water mm -hmm. to stay green. So you have the conflict of not killing the tree and not killing your lawn. Mm -hmm. So before you install your lawn, uh, multiple times you have irrigation system installed, trenching, so that trenches, those trenches sometimes, very often, uh, cut a, a lot of the roots that bring stress to the tree. You bring sod and you, twice a day, most of the time, you do have water into the root system of that oak. All of a sudden the tree goes from very well adapted to drought in the summer to constant moisture into the ground. And that will stress the tree to a point where you could have armillaria root rot, which is a very common disease in, uh, in trees. And uh, the main roots are getting eaten away. And you barely see it until the tree falls over. Oh, yeah. oh that would it, be yeah. so It happens so a lot. It happens a lot. And it, it's mostly due to water irrigation. And that's primarily yeah. for the white oak? Uh, white oak, uh, Douglas firs, madrones, uh, those three, uh, ponderosa pines, incense cedars. The ones that, that like to yeah, be dry yeah. in the summer. They, the, yeah, the dry summers, the trees that are you know, established in the valley as native trees mm -hmm. will not need water in the summer. Big leaf maple is a different story. Big leaf maple, by habit, will, will be more on the forest, on the, the valley floor, closer to the, the river where the soil is actually much better. Mm -hmm. And a uh, big leaf maple will be fine having regular, you know, water supply in the summer. Uh, but again, I, I always tell people, do not overwater your trees, especially an irrigation system that just broadcasts and splashes the trunk could lead to uh, problems like that, yeah. Armillaria root rot is a common, common issue. Well, on that note, why don't you um, tell us about common pests and diseases yeah. that afflict mm -hmm. the trees in our area? I really want to mention some of the new pests that have uh, come in the valley recently. Well, everybody knows about the aphids. Um, everybody knows about the scabs on the apple trees. And, you know, uh, those are, you know, we know them, we know we, we have remedies for those, but uh, lately I've seen uh, two main pests that have been in the valley and are making really a dent into some, some population. First one would be, actually it's a disease that is carried by a pest called the thousand cankers disease on black that. walnut. The thousand canker disease is introduced in walnut by the help of a very tiny, extremely tiny bark beetle. Um, the bark beetle has the spores of the disease on its body hair and gets into the top canopy of the tree in twigs, enters the twig to lay eggs, and in the same time inoculates the disease into the canopy. And the problem is with the canker is it's a dead spot that spreads, so it eventually girdles the, the, the stem. And it's the coalescence of multiple entry holes that creates large dieback into the canopy. Mm. And so we, we had that question, my boss Nathaniel and I, about uh, 10 years ago now almost. And we were having coffee actually, and we just talked about the same thing. He said, this morning I saw black walnut, and I said, tell me, tell me about it. And he said, the top was drying out. I said, I had the same thing. So we start thinking, what could it be, what could it be? And we try to figure out if there had been any trenching, any uh, irrigation issues, any, any uh, large uh, root uh, problem. And we figured out it was none of that. So we called the city of Eugene, called our friend Scott, and he said, yeah, we have some problems with uh, some of our trees too. And I said, that's right. You know, I've seen some of the city trees having the same issue. They sent samples to OSU, and they said, yes, you do have the thousand cankers disease, which is uh, pretty new in the valley, and it's actually killing uh, a lot of the trees. 
it is uh, you do have limb failures and some branches are falling over mm. and it's it's very very brutal uh, I do not think there is any any spray or any any treatment for that disease that I know of. What about just removing mm. the, the dead it, part? The, the you, dead yes, part, yes. take that away and destroy it. Can yeah, you, you save you the can tree do that. that way? You could delay the disease. You could just uh, slow it down. But most of the trees, you know, it's 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 unfair because if you look at the beauty of a black walnut, it's usually the center, large portion of the tree that is get getting killed. It usually mm -hmm. starts at the top. So oh, the tree will sad. be disfigured for sure, mm -hmm. but you could actually keep it alive for a few years. But you have to keep an eye on it. Every year you might have another branch falling over or drying out. So these beetles yeah. are coming from somewhere well, they're traveling. and, and recolonizing yes. yeah. where, yes. where you've already removed mm -hmm. one dead branch mm -hmm. and then they start the process again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and it's, uh, uh, they're so tiny that sometimes you, you could have like a, a piece of wood chip that still has the larvae inside, mm -hmm. and then there's been an, and a, then you a, carry a that touch. someplace yeah, with it's you. It's really, really a bad one. The Chelm disease came back in the valley a few years ago. Uh, it's, it's fairly common uh, in some portions of the the city. I saw quite a few trees being killed two or three years ago, and uh, but it's still around. The Chelm disease, uh, also carried by a Chum? Is that what you said? Dutch elm. Oh, Dutch elm. Dutch elm disease. D D. Yeah. <laughs> Dutch elm disease, and uh, it's carried also by a, a little um, bark beetle, and also via cross co uh, cross grafting of roots. If you have two elms, mm -hmm. one of them gets sick, and they're so close to each other that they touch, the roots oh. are actually grafting. The disease can be transferred one, from one tree to the other. Mm. But it's it's. Uh, it can be, you can actually treat a tree like, uh, like an American elm from uh, being killed by the Dutch elm disease preventatively. You have to have the tree uh, injected, which is, you know, costs money but helps the tree staying alive, actually. Uh, the is Ferry Tree Care able no, to do don't. that? No, we don't. Never, we never decided to go with pesticides, and uh, we're doing just fine without that. It's a... Uh, it's something that we don't want to deal with. We don't want to put chemicals in the atmosphere and deal with the, with the poison. Pretty so, much. so your stance is that it's better to take the tree away rather than. Oh, than that's a very good it. question. I mean, ethically, I'd rather see the tree being kept. If you have a m magnificent American elm and you want to protect it, I would say yes. Just inject insecticide so you keep the tree alive. Because there's no, unless you do this, there's no way you can have the tree. If the disease is around, you take an enormous risk. The tree can actually reach the tree and kill it in time. If the tree is injected, it will be on a regular program of being injected, and you can actually keep the, the disease at bay mm -hmm. because you would kill the insect that brings the disease in. So... It, it's, uh, I would say in that case, yes, but we just happen not to inject trees or spray trees. We, we never did that. And the new, ki new kid on the block is the bronze birch borer, which is uh, the first one I found was three years ago. Um. I'm sorry, but yeah. we we are running out of time. Yeah, I I, I wish fast. I could <laughs> I, I wish I could hear more about that, and probably yeah. everybody would like to hear yeah, more yeah. about that. But maybe we can have you Bronze come Bird's back. Bronze Birch Borer, just Google it. <laughs> Google it, or yeah. or talk to Sperry Tree Care. Oh yeah, yeah, they could call me anytime. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Okay. It's been very interesting. Thank you. This has been Gardening and Beyond, a show for folks who drive their family to distraction with gardening to-do lists. Join us next week as we voyage via Verdant Vineyards. See you then.